we have a presentation on the Parthian Cataphract by Patrick Smith. Patrick Smith uh, is a research analyst, writer, and independent scholar, and he is a member and contributor to the World History Encyclopedia, which are, uh, is one of our streamers today. He is, a pre he is presented for the American Academy of Religion, Society of Biblical Literature, and American School for, of Oriental Research, and the Missouri Academy of Science at different venues throughout the United States. Um, Mr. Smith? Well, okay. I just want to thank you, Sam, and I want to thank uh, Sasa for inviting me and accepting my proposal, and uh, special thanks to the prior presenters. All I can say is, wow, that's that's a, that's really, really interesting and very well done. We hope our pre uh, presentation will equal that. So uh, let me bring this up uh, on my uh, screen share here. What we want to talk about today is one of Carthia's main military assets, the cataphract a combination of heavy horse and rider that was fully armored. But first, to put things in context, ruling from 247 to 224, Parthia's empire stretched between the Mediterranean in the west to India in the east. Pretty, uh, pretty expansive place. From a timeline, Parthia got its start by moving south out of Scythia into the Greek Seleucid Empire in 330 BCE that it eventually took over in the second century BCE where the Parthians were instrumental. Other pivotal dates include their takeover of Media in 148 from whom they learned or employed to breed a better horse. Their defeat of the Romans at Caere in 53 BCE in modern day Turkey represents the zenith of cataphract and bow technology. Finally, while it is not known the role of the cataphract in Parthia's defeat of Mark Anthony in 36 CE or their loss to the Romans in 166, their battle with the Sasanians in 224 shows the cataphract was still a robust instrument of war. As they were influenced militarily by the Scythians, as horse archers, the Parthians kept to Scythia's general hit and run tactics and avoidance of direct engagement with set infantry formations. The improvements they made, as you see here, were fourfold. They bred better horses, they manufactured stronger bows, they streamlined their weapons to a primary use of lances, swords, and bows, and they made innovative use of heavy cavalry resulting in the cataphract as a fully armored, what I call a horse tank. These three artifacts here, represent uh, the, uh, in, in the superiority of the, I think, the Parthian uh, bow as opposed to the Scythian. The ones above are Parthian ones. And if you look at them in relation to the, to the body of the person and the horse, they certainly seem much larger than the lower ones of the Scythian. Uh, that figurine uh, looks fairly minuscule in relation to the body. So it does appear uh, that the, at least by appearance, that the uh, the Parthian bows were, were superior. The, uh, the bows were of a, of a composite recurve construction that the Scythians invented. If you compare the size of their bow, a bow, as I mentioned, in relation to the body, the Parthian bows certainly appear larger. Uh, Plutarch mentions how Parthia's large and mighty bows shot arrows that tore through every covering, whether hard or soft. As a cataphract and horse archers worked in concert, half the equation for Parthia's military success was the horse. Well, I'm trying to get my uh, slides to move forward here, so I'm not sure what's going on here. Hmm. Hmm. There we go. Breeding better horses, of course, was essential. And key for Parthia was their takeover of Media, a nation known for their superior breeds. Polybius mentions royal studs cared for the poor by the Medes. Strabo mentions a plush meadow in Media where 50,000 mares grazed, indicating Media's influence. Strabo also compares Parthian horses to the horses of Media. 
which he says were the best and largest in the king's province. Then indicating Parthia's achievement in breeding a better horse, Strabo says their horses were superior to all other breeds. For one, as you can see, as he says, because of, quote, their fleetness, that they were the fastest around meant their riders could quickly chase down the enemy or more easily escape when pursued. Finally, in contrast, as their light infantry horse was bred for speed and maneuverability, their heavy horse cataphract, or focus, would have been bred for a combination of size, speed, and courage in close combat. The purpose of the cataphract was to work in concert with their fast, nimble, and more numerous horse archers. According to Cassius Dio, when they were not mopping up fleeing combatants, the heavy horse cataphracts, the riders, as you see, each with a lance, ran pell-mell into enemy formations. Besides not, those not impaled, such a massive animal at top speed would, like a bowling ball, have scattered soldiers left and right, even causing those near the area of impact to be jostled. Besides those, direct, those directly killed or trampled with bodies flying, fighters fleeing, and soldiers down the cataphract would have created gaps of vulnerability, their main purpose, into which Parthian horse archers shot. Multiple cataphracts attacking a formation at once would have had a devastating effect up and down the line of defense. But what did the cataphract, horse and rider, look like more completely? As Simon Nechev and I worked on the image you see for world history, his artistry, of course, how did we come to this rendition? For starters, besides the heavy horse that the rider commanded, the rider would have been held in place with a saddle. An important advent before stirrups was the integration of the pommel and cantel onto the rider's seat. These help the rider to stay on when jostled, give stability when the horse breaks, and assist maneuverability in a turn. While some ancient images appear to show, such as this one in Dura Europa graffiti, to show Parthian riders without saddles, but material evidence concerning their availability is definitive. According to Elena Stepanova's detailed recreation based on finds dating to the fourth century BCE, the Scythians crafted an ingenious four-part saddle of split pommels and cantles. The de design itself reveals the rider's purpose, turning and directional changes as well as, as, well as su swift acceleration. Such saddles are also found, as you see here on the Black Sea Bosporan release of Cimmerian horse archers dating to the second and first century BCE. While these saddles were probably for light horse cavalry, Parthia's heavy cataphracts would have needed a simpler design. Given their head on impact and extraction purpose, it probably, I think, a robust two-part design is probable. While the cantle and pommel helped cradle the rider on impact, the pommel would keep the rider from being unhorsed as he pulled back from the melee, something the Gauls in fact tried to do at the Battle of Kerhe by grabbing the rider's lances. At the Firuzabad, a uh, substantial pommel and possible cantle uh, appears evident on the Swiss Sasanian riders from the relief at Firuzabad, Iran. And as you can see, the left, uh, you see of the three circles that I made there, the left one I was going to try to point to, but I can't find my pointer. But uh, that could be that could be a uh, full cantle, but it also it could also be a sword hilt. But you see uh, the 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 second one from left to right, that definitely is a is a split pommel. But yet over here of the same group of Sasanian riders, you have a full pommel with holes in it, which is interestingly, you can, uh, some saddles even today have these type holes, uh, perhaps serving a, a rope type purpose. A substantial and pop, uh, as I mentioned that about the pommel and cantle, again, that Parthian Scythian relations were ongoing, that the Scythians and Parthians, Parthia's contemporary, the Cimmerians and conquerors, the Sasanians, used saddles makes it likely the Parthians did too. When it came to the cataphract riders' weapons, the Parthians kept it simple. 
uh, unlike the Scythians, uh, they which employed, they even employed infantry, they had uh, other type weapons, axes, uh, maces, etc. But the Parthians, interestingly, really reduced their array of metal, of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of weapons. And they kept it simple using basically for the Parthian uh, rider, the cataphract rider, using a long metal tip spear and a long sword. But what was the appearance of horse and rider since both were fully armored? For the rider, breastplate, helmet, and mail would have been used while the horse would have been protected by a full gambeson of scale. One of the best sources for an image and end use of the Parthian cataphract is Plutarch's own account of the Battle of Caere. There, with Serena in command, 1,000 Parthian cataphracts and 9,000 horse archers defeated with Crassus in command, Rome's 30,000 infantry and 4,000 cavalry. You think it would have been a no contest for the Romans, but it wasn't, and, and I think basically because of, uh, of the cataphract. In his account of the Battle of the Cataphract, writers, Plutarch mentions their, quote, their blazing helmets and breastplate, their Marjanian steel glittering keen and bright, unquote, that their helmets and breastplates were of Marjanian steel and they blazed in the sunlight is telling. The moniker Marjanian steel like Damascus swords or Corinthian helmets suggested a highly, a higher quality product. Interestingly, a higher grade steel is stronger and less prone to corrosion. And it keeps and displays a keener sheen. Moreover, that their helmets and breastplates shone so brightly suggests a fuller surface of reflection, something full helmets and cuirass-like breastplates would do. Later in the same battle, Plutarch again mentions steel breastplates, but also including leather ones. Obviously, like many armies of antiquity, there was a varying standard of equipment. Perhaps the poorer nobles could only afford the cheaper but still effective leather breastplates. Interestingly, the word cuirass carries a leather construction etymology. Cuirasses can be traced to classical antiquity with surviving Greek ones dating to 620 BCE. As vassals and conquerors of the Seleucid Greeks, such products would have been familiar and likely used by the Parthians. Even their conquerors used them carved to celebrate Sasanian victory over the Parthians in 224 CE. The Firuzabad relief in Iran shows full breastplates on Sasanian and Parthian writers alike. And if you look at the left, uh, the left relief, you see the, the individual with a helmet in scale uh, protecting it. That is the Parthian king. And then the other two writers to the left of him and then to the right, they, these were Sasanian uh, warriors. But just as sure was the availability, availability I'm sorry, of Greek style helmets. Their cousins, models, and sometimes allies, the Scythians to the north used them. As Scythian Cuban bronzed helmets date to the sixth century BCE with cheek pieces and neck protection, the use of Greek helmets of Corinthian, Attic, or Chalcidian type were beginning to become popular in the fifth century BCE. Then along with the helmets and breastplates, Plutarch also mentions the use of mail, likely invented by the Celts and one of the most popular forms of personal ar armor used through medieval times, mail consisted of a tiny metal rings joined together to form a metal fabric. Worn like clothing, mail provided the wearer a degree of maneuverability, lamellar and laminar armor does not. As nations have used it, more often in combination with other types of armor, the Parthians and Carcare used coats of mail underneath helmets and breastplates. One of the pivotal moments of the battle was when after Crassus's main body was pummeled and pinned down by the arrows of Serena's horse archers, Publius with Roman cavalry broke out in chase after the Parthian cataphracts. As the Parthians led Publius on for some distance, their mail-clad horsemen suddenly whirled about to confront the Romans. As this was happening, Parthia's horse archers kicked up a huge cloud of dust, causing the Romans to close rank in confusion. That made easy targets for Parthia's horse archers. Desperate to escape this mess, Publius once more charged the cataphracts, but as Plutarch again refers, the mail-clad horsemen 
with longer pikes made it in no contest against the scantily clad Gauls with small spears. Thus, it is probable the appearance of Serena's cataphract riders at Care included a full helmets and combined use of mail and breastplates. In preparation, they would have had first dressed in their usual tunic and trousers, and I think very possibly per perhaps they would have padded those since the disadvantage of mail is it does allow blunt force trauma. They then would have covered themselves head to ankle with mail and over that the breastplate and helmet. Finally, bearing in mind, the Romans would have slashed and stabbed at anything and everything, extra protection of shins, arms, hands, and feet would likely have been employed. As the Greek-style greaves were known and used by the Scythians, letter or metal greaves for the shins would have made sense for the Parthians. For the horse, while Plutarch describes Parthian horses clad in plates of bronze and steel, and Herodotus mentions early use of scale armor by Persian soldiers, Images like the Dura Europus drawing of a Parthian horse and those of Sarmatian horses on Trajan column suggest, a scale, suggest scale was a popular choice for the heavy horse of antiquity. Consisting of overlapping metal plates sewn onto a cloth or leather undergarment called a gambeson, the Parthian heavy horse was, except for legs and tail, enveloped in scale. While there is some debate about a, what, a well, what a cataphract is, much of the confusion stems from a conflation of heavy cav cavalry and cataphracts. While heavy, cav ca heavy, excuse me, while heavy cavalry at different countries fielded them, performed different purposes, the Parthian cataphract de defined as a tank of sort was meant to punch through enemy lines. But the Parthian cataphract also evolved, and that is the nature of warfare. Countering tactics combined with intellectual and material in innovation all add to the ongoing changing nature of military asset, defensive or offensive. And even at the battle between Serena and Crassus, things quickly changed. As Crassus smartly stacked the depth of his front lines into a square column formation in anticipation of cataphract of impact, Serena just as smartly chose to put his cataphract tanks on hold and instead unleashed a punishing array of arrows from his horse archers. As we saw, anticipating a breakout of Crassus' heavy cavalry, this is when Serena feigned retreat, putting his cataphracts in flight, running the Romans into an ambush of more arrows and one-on-one -on -one heavy cavalry combat. Again, as to appearance, the Feruzabad relief clearly shows Parthian and Sasanian writers, writers wearing breastplates. Additionally, as the Sasanian writers use mail for arm and leg protection, and the Parthians use laminar and dons a full helmet with scale protection for the neck, the Sasanians wear only headbands. And that is telling. As it relates to tactics, if there is one impression the Feruzabad relief means to show, it is the swiftness of their riders and steeds. With their horses in midair at full gallop, their tails horizontal and the riders hair and scarves swept behind, the swiftness of their cavalry is apparent. Thus it appears the Sasanians employed a change of use. Overall, there appears to be a lightening of the load for speed. The Take Bostan image from the fourth century CE shows a Sasanian cataphract horse with front armor only of what appears to be a partial gambeson of padded cloth, not the full gambeson of metal scale of the Parthian cataphract. Not only does this reveal less weight, but an ending of the tactic of full penetration to enemy ranks and the ensuing melee. Moreover, at Feruzabad, their shelving of head and neck protection provided some weight reduction while allowing a broader field of vision and advantage for change of direction maneuvering. Sporting their fashionable diadems, these riders certainly do not seem to be worried about strikes to the head or neck. Thus, for the Sasanians, an added emphasis on speed and maneuverability appears to be the order of the day. Finally, was this change of use a contributing cause of Parthia's demise at the hands of the Sasanians? Though Parthia's internal strife weakened them as they clung to their slower moving, weight heavy cataphracts, probably. 
In conclusion, ultimately it appears the heavy cataphract used as a tank to break infantry lines as, as the Parthians designed them would finally go from select to little use until the Middle Ages with comparable imp implementation by the Byzantines. So there you have it. Amazing, thank you so much. So uh, we do have a couple of questions. Uh, give me one moment. So for the first question, type this in the chat as well. Yeah. So in terms of archeological data about the uh, bows and the difference between the bows that were used. Yeah. Do we know if there's a difference in the types of wood or materials used to construct the weapons? I'm glad you asked that because I was wanting to talk about the, their bows. Uh, so thank you. But the Scythians, of course, they used what is called a recurve bow. I had one when I was a kid when I was 15 and, and they definitely can be lethal. Uh, this was just a 55 pound bow. Uh, and it was uh, composite, and it was a recurve. Uh, more, some of your modern, and that is your modern bows, and they were built much like the the Scythian bows. And and obviously, as the Parthians built them too, they were they were laminate, and and today it's a lamination process. Uh, but then too, and and I think the Mongols used them also. I, I think it really started with the Scythians. Uh, the Scythians, it was a combination of lamination of bone, of sinew, and, and horn. And it was just, again, you saw the configuration of the sort of uh, circular configuration. And that recurve uh, configuration, what that did was that allowed greater acceleration applied to the arrow as it left the bow. And, uh, and also, therefore, you could have a shorter bow, which would be advantageous when, uh, when you're riding a horse and you're shooting from a horse. Unlike the, uh, the, the English longbows, they were, I believe, as tall as a person, maybe taller, I think, maybe around six feet tall, if not. And, um, and, and so uh, you could not use a longbow on a horse, but that was the advantage that, that of, of the recurve construction. Now, the, the Parthians perfected on the, on the Scythian bow, as, as you saw, and as, par, as Plutarch attests, I mean, they were so made so strong, and I believe one estimate is was a 100-pound release. The bow I had as a kid was about 55 pounds, so, and you had, of course, they're using these bows ever since they were little kids, and they had to have developed some extra strength in their upper, upper body here. Uh, uh, but uh, so th those, those Parthian bows were, were larger, but as I was getting ready to say, uh, Plutarch does mention how they tore through everything, everything hard and soft. And uh, the Romans really suffered, I mean, at this battle. And not only did they lose, Crassus lost his life, Publius, his son, lost his life. I'm not, uh, I'd have to look back, but I'm not sure anyone survived. But more importantly, uh, uh, to the Romans, uh, they, they, the, 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 uh, the Parthians took the Roman standards, and that was a, a psychological blow to Rome. It's like stealing their soul. You know, they, these standards have had uh, magical uh, uh, powers to them, and they had they represented the might of 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 of, of Rome. And this uh, this was used later as a bargaining chip between the Parthians and and Augustus in 30 BCE or CE uh, that the Romans did get their standards back. But uh, yeah, anything else? Uh, yeah, I've got a couple more questions in the chat. So one was that you mentioned that chainmail was invented by the Celts. Do we yeah. know how this technology transfer would have occurred? You mean from the uh, Celts to others after them? Yes, to the well, specifically from like the Celts to Persians. To the uh, from the Celts to the Parthians. Mm -hmm. Well, the, of course, the the Celts would have, they would have passed that on to the Scythians, and the Scythians would have they, uh, the Parthians would have adopted that technology from the from the, uh, the the Scythians. The Parthians would have adopted that technology from the Scythians. 
And of course, as I mentioned, uh, that that was used uh, even until medieval times. And the advantage, as I mentioned, was to is like a fabric. So you could you would it wouldn't be so cumbersome as some of the laminar that the Romans use or the, or the lamellar uh, 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 type of of um, protection. Uh, so it, it the advantage of it is it it um, you had maneuverability. You could wear it like a piece of clothing. The disadvantage of it was that um, it, it did allow for blunt force trauma. Plus, also it was weighty on the sh shoulders. So some of these uh, uh, fellows they use the laminar uh, uh, type of scale or type of metal in their abdomen to hold up the the uh, the male shirt so it wasn't so heavy on the shoulders. But to answer your question directly, I don't know how the, the transfer of the technology, but we do know it was transferred. And of course they used it up even during up to and during medieval times. Interesting, thank you. And we have one more question. Are there examples of reverse engineering between the Parthians and Scythians? Would they try to replicate efficient bow or saddle design? Well, uh, like I mentioned to you too, like I mentioned on the par on the Parthian bows, they of course it was it's interesting how the Parthians really uh, learned from the mistake that the Scythians made, especially when they went up against uh, 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 some of their opponents. The Scythians used uh, they used infantry. In fact, I believe they uh, uh, served as their own infantry. Parthians went away from that. All they did was they basically narrowed it down to their bows, swords, and then and then for the the uh, the, the Parthian cataphract rider a long sword, and for the uh, smaller the smaller horse infantry uh, they used the the bows and then a smaller sword too. But as far as reverse engineering, I, I think they just improved on on what the Scythians provided them, and they improved their tactics too. And what's interesting is really uh, the, the Parthians were the only nation that had brought Rome to a stalemate and they held their own for many years and they did bring uh, Rome to the t bargaining table where they both agreed to a stalemate. So they, they, they used their, their tactics were very efficient. One of the things that they, they learned from the Scythians is never engage. And they, uh, as far as directly, never engage in a set in, uh, formation. So they always kept their distance and shot from uh, shot their arrows from a, from a distance, but they did use the, the it was up up close and personal a personal with the with the heavy cataphract. I mean, they would run right directly into an, in a Roman formation. Well, you can imagine that the 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 courage it had to have taken on the part of the horse, let alone, and then on the part of the rider itself. I mean, it just uh, pr pretty amazing once once you look into it. Oh, absolutely. That's, it's incredible. Thank you so much for this presentation. It was okay. wonderful to listen to. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Sam.